the only British Prime Minister ever to be assassinated was Spencer Percival. On the evening of the 11th of May 1812, an assassin who was in the lobby of the House of Commons stepped forward and drew out his pistol, and fired shots into Percival's chest. The Prime Minister fell to the floor, but within a few minutes he was pronounced dead. Many believed to begin with that this was the start of an uprising, but the assassin made no attempt whatsoever to escape his fate. John Bellingham was the man who took the fateful deadly shots, writing himself as the only man in British history to assassinate a Prime Minister. But on the 18th of May, 1812, at the age of just 42, he was hanged in public for his crimes. Join us today as we look at the story of Spencer Percival's assassination and also the execution of the assassin. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. John Bellingham's early life is not well known, and there was much speculation about his life following his brutal actions. It's believed he was born in 1769 and was raised in London where he became an apprentice jeweller at the age of 14. Two years later he went on a voyage with the Royal Navy from Gravesend to China, but on board this ship a mutiny took place on the 22nd of May 1787, and the ship then ran aground and sank. But Bellingham managed to survive, and in early 1794, it's believed he opened a tin factory in London on Oxford Street, but it failed and he was then declared bankrupt. There is some speculation as to whether this was Bellingham or another man of the same name, but he then worked as a clerk in a counting house, and then in the 1800s he went to Russia, and acted as an agent for exporters and importers. In 1802 he returned to England, and was a broker in Liverpool, and the following year he got married before he yet again went to Russia to work. In autumn 1803, the Russian ship, named the Salier, was lost in the White Sea. The owners filed an insurance claim, but an anonymous letter said that the ship had been sabotaged. Many believe that this letter was written by Bellingham, but the ship owner accused him of a debt of almost 5,000 rubles. Bellingham then, when he was about to return to Britain, had his traveller's pass revoked because of this debt. The local Governor-General imprisoned Bellingham, and a year later he managed to achieve his freedom, before he then went to St. Petersburg. Whilst here he tried to impeach the Governor-General, showing how he was not a man who would shy away from shocking actions, but the Russians were not happy with this. He was charged with leaving the area in a rebellious manner, and was imprisoned yet again for another year, before he left Russia for England in December 1809. However, when he came back on British soil, he wanted compensation for his Russian imprisonment, and he believed the government should have given him money. This was rejected, as the UK did not have diplomatic relations with Russia, and Bellingham's wife asked him to leave it and not go any further. But he would not listen. In 1812 he continued, and he visited the Foreign Office, where he was told by a civil servant that with regards to his case, he could practically do and try as he wished to further it. He petitioned to the Prince Regent and the Privy Council, and even the Home Office and the Treasury, and they replied with polite refusals. He then sent a copy of his request to every single Member of Parliament, but nothing happened, and he wrote to a magistrate at Bow Street Court, saying that the government had closed the door of justice, and he asked the court to help him. But following the meeting with a Treasury official, he decided to take action into his own hands. John Bellingham then on the 20th of April 1812, visited a gunsmith on Skinner Street, and he purchased two pistols and some ammunition. He then visited a tailor who put an inside pocket in his coat jacket. Bellingham on the 11th of May 1812 made his way into the House of Commons, and he set himself up inside of the lobby there. No one suspected anything that day, as he had been there before, and had spoken with some journalists. Bellingham's actions did not arouse suspicion, and he spent the morning writing letters and visiting his wife's business partner but he arrived in the lobby shortly before five o'clock. Spencer Percival, the Prime Minister, who had served since October 1809, was present, and he had a rapid rise to power across the nation. He had been the Chancellor and the leader of the House of Commons before he became the Prime Minister. He was the head of a weak government, and faced a number of issues, including the madness of King George III, and also the Luddite riots, but he overcame these. But Bellingham that evening was awaiting inside the lobby of the House of Commons, and he was armed with his weapon. In the House, the session began at 4.30pm, and the Whig MP, Henry Brougham, outlined the Prime Minister's absence, and he said he should have been there. But then Percival was fetched from Downing Street, and he arrived at 5.15pm. But seeing the Prime Minister enter the lobby, 
he was confronted by John Bellingham, who then drew out his pistol and shouted at him, before he fired his pistol into the Prime Minister's chest. Percival staggered forward a few steps and shouted, I am murdered, and then he fell face down at the MP for Norwich's feet. This MP, William Smith, turned the man over and noticed it was the Prime Minister, and then he was carried away into the Speaker's quarters and was propped up on a table with his feet on two chairs. However, he was not really there, and despite there being a faint pulse, when a doctor arrived a few moments later, his pulse had stopped and he was declared dead. Following the shooting, Bellingham the assassin, it's claimed, sat on a bench, but some would say that he walked quietly out onto the street and he would have escaped, and the committer of the murder would never have been known. But an official who saw the shooting then ordered Bellingham to be seized, and he had him disarmed, and then whilst this happened, he remained calm. He was asked to explain what he'd done, and he said he was only making amends for the justice he'd been denied by the government. Bellingham was then transferred to the sergeant at arms quarters, and MPs and magistrates held a short hearing in this makeshift court, and messengers were sent to search Bellingham's house. The assassin remained calm and said, I've been ill-treated, I've sought redress in vain, I'm a most unfortunate man, and feel here sufficient justification for what I've done. He said he'd tried all he could to get the government to take action he believed he was entitled to, as in the compensation for his imprisonment, and he said, I've done my worst and I rejoice in the deed. At 8pm that evening, he was formally charged with the assassination of the Prime Minister and was sent to Newgate Prison for his trial. His trial took place on Friday the 15th of May 1812 at the Old Bailey in London, and he did claim he would have preferred to shoot the British ambassador to Russia, but instead went after the Prime Minister. His formal statement said, Recollect, gentlemen, what was my situation. Recollect that my family was ruined and myself destroyed, merely because it was Mr Percival's pleasure that justice should not be granted, sheltering himself behind the imagined security of his station, and trampling upon the law and right in the belief that no retribution could reach him. I demand only my right and not a favour. I demand what is a birthright and privilege of every Englishman. Gentlemen, when a minister sets himself above the laws, as Mr Percival did, he does it at his own personal risk. If this were not so, the mere will of the minister would become the law, and what would then become of your liberties? I trust that this serious lesson will operate as a warning to all future ministers, and that they will henceforth do the thing that is right, for if the upper ranks of society are permitted to act wrong with impunity, the inferior ramifications will soon become wholly corrupted. Gentlemen, my life is in your hands. I rely confidently in your justice. Defence lawyers tried to make Bellingham look insane, but this was rejected, and Bellingham was found guilty of the murder of Spencer Percival, the Prime Minister, and was sentenced to death. His execution was fixed for the 18th of May, and the day before he was visited by a priest to see him if he would repent. He did not, and the priest left disappointed, saying, A mere dreadful instance of depravity and hardness of heart has surely never occurred. The evening before the execution, Bellingham wrote a final letter to his wife, saying, Nine hours more will waft me in those happy shores, where bliss is without alloy. But outside Newgate Prison, on the 18th of May, a huge crowd had gathered. Soldiers were also there, as they had heard the news that there were some people who were plotting to rescue Bellingham for his actions. But the crowd was calmed and held back, and Bellingham appeared on the scaffold before eight o'clock. It was said he mounted the steps of the gallows, with the utmost celerity, his tread was bold and firm, no indication of trembling, faltering, or irresolution appeared. He was then blindfolded and the rope was fastened around his neck, and a final prayer was said. As the clock struck eight, the trap door was released, and Bellingham plunged to his death. The crowd reaction was described as anxious looks, half-horrified countenances, mournful tears, and unanimous blessings. His body was then cut down and was sent for dissection, but his clothes were sold to bidders in the public. Another witness described the crowd's sentiments as, Farewell, poor man. You owe satisfaction to the offended laws of your country, and God bless you. You have rendered an important service to your country. You have taught ministers that they should do justice and grant audience when it is asked of them. Following his death, people even shockingly raised money for the widow and children of John Bellingham, as they must have been in opposition to Percival's politics. But John Bellingham is remembered today as a man who assassinated the only British Prime Minister to be killed 
whilst he was in office. His acts cemented him in the history books as being a man who held a grudge, but would do anything to enact revenge against the government who he believed were punishing him. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. And once again, thank you so much for watching.